Pakistan. And I'm really uh, honored to introduce uh, Sheikh Hassan Al Ashab. Uh, Sheikh Hassan has extensively studied several disciplines, including principles of jurisprudence, uh, usul al fiqh, Arabic, grammar, uh, philology, and literature. He has also received many ijazat, which are licensed to teach from prominent scholars in hadith and a comparative jurisprudence, fiqh, and the sciences of Quran. He has studied under several of the most foremost uh, of the foremost Islamic scholars in Morocco. And Sheikh Hassan is the spearheading faculty member of the, uh, the Taysir Seminary. And he currently resides in Knoxville with his wife and three children, mashallah. So we're very honored to have Sheikh Hassan joining us today. He'll be reflecting for uh, 20 minutes, inshallah, on uh, Surah, uh, on uh, Ayas from uh, Surah Al-Kaf, and then the Friday lesson. So with that, uh, I'll bring Sheikh Hassan to the stage. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. How are you all doing today? Alhamdulillah, we're really grateful uh, to have you joining us today. May Allah ta'ala bless you and your families. Ask Allah ta'ala to grant us the benefits of this day and the benefits what's before it and the benefits what's after it and make this hour an hour in which our dua is accepted, inshallah. Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. Alhamdulillah, uh, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa baraka ala madhana rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam muslima. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin ma'a dhakaraka wa dhakarahu dhakirun, wa afla'an dhikrika wa dhikrika wa dhikrika We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank him and we um, praise him for all of what he had, for had bestowed upon us subhanahu wa azza wa jal. And we implore peace and blessing upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam and his family and his companions and his followers. Um, I plead with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we and I supplicate him to make this moment a moment of acceptance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to overlook our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill our needs from him if he knows that they are good for us. If he knows that they are otherwise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose the best for us and to grant us that which is good for us, good for our families and the people around us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to make us prophetic through and through in every way. Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and my dear sisters, um, Surah Al-Kahf um, is a very unique surah in many ways. And of course, every surah is unique in many ways. Uh, surah Al-Kahf, especially Surah Al-Kahf, um, has a theme that runs through all the stories that go th that, 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 that the surah is made of. And it is a surah that starts with the with the uh, with with showing gratitude to Allah Taala and praise to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It has a lot of merits. There are hadith about it. You could you could look it up. The hadith of the merits of Surah Kaf, and why we should read Surah Kaf in Friday, and why we read Surah the, we should memorize the, the first part of Surah Kaf. The Prophet Sallallahu told us that it is it is um, safety and assured safety from the Dajjal. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. The Dajjal being the highest manifestation of materialism on earth. The highest, the highest manifestation of, the highest manifestation is the Dajjal. The Prophet ﷺ told us about the Dajjal is all the highest manifestation of that materialism. Right? Every single thing that is antithetical to faith, every single thing that is antithetical to submission, submit, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is manifested in the Dajjal. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ told us to read in the beginning of the, the beginning of the, of, of, uh, uh, the memorize the first 10 verses. Um, in, if the, if the, not just to be cured, for, not just to be safe from the Dajjal, if, we're, if we die before the Dajjal shows so up, then what's the purpose? If we don't have the, the, great, the great signs of the Sa'a, then what's the purpose, right? It's, it seems that it's for very specific people at certain time, at certain time. But that's not how they understood it. It's not how, this is not how the, the, the great companions and the great people of this generation understood the, 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 the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They thought of it to be that is against every single thing that is antithetical to faith. At the beginning of which, and at the core of which, is individualism and materialism. Every part of the surah reminds us of the, the, the demise and the danger 
and the 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 calamity that comes with the calamities in this world in the next that come with individualism and materialism and the portion that i want to talk about today is not dif- is not different than that this theme runs through all the stories of of surah al-kahf this is the story of sidna musa you all have heard about the story of sidna musa or had heard of a piece of the story of sidna musa because the story of sidna musa is the most repeated story in the quran sidna musa was repeated in sidna musa's name and story was repeated in the quran more than 139 times more than 139 times sidna musa was uh, more than it spanned over 34 39 verses 39 chapters of the quran and it's it's uh, strange that the surah speaks about sidna musa again and again and again and again and it's, it seems that the Prophet وسلم, and in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, there is no Prophet had, that has been mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, more than Sidna Musa. And it's, it's, it's not even close. Not even close. Right? So one had to ask this question, why then Sidna Musa is mentioned this much? Why the story of Bani Israel? If you think the, the, the backdrop of most of the Qur'an is the story of Banu Israel and Sidna Musa or Sidna Musa uh, or Banu Israel and other prophets, right? The backdrop of the Qur'an, most of the, back, most of the stories of the Qur'an relates to Banu Israel one way or another. Even a time where the subject is about law or subject is about something that the Muslim community or that the Muslim community in Medina has been doing or not doing. They're always that comparison, there's always that backdrop that the believers had, ought to pay attention to as they practice their religion. Sidna Musa matters to us a lot, not just on theological level, on practical level. Sidna Musa, alayhi salam, the story of Sidna Musa, I was thinking of doing a, we, we started talking about doing a podcast about Moses and us just to go over all the details of what the story of Sidna Musa means to us here in the 21st century in America or in the West or whatever you are, right? What does the story of Sidna Musa means? Why Allah Ta'ala repeated it this much? Why Sidna Musa is relevant in the hadith of the Prophet prominent in the hadith of the Prophet as well? Sidna Musa was one of the teachers of the Prophet Sidna Musa is extremely consequential in the, for the Ummah. For he was one of the teachers of the Prophet. ﷺ. He taught him how to be a prophet. He taught him how to be a prophet. ﷺ. This idea that the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet and all of a sudden he, he knew what to do is not true. The Prophet ﷺ had to learn the ropes of being a prophet. And Sidna Jibreel was one of his teachers, and Sidna Musa was in one of his teachers. The, the discussion that Sidna Musa had with the Prophet in the night of the Isra al Mi'raj shows how much the Prophet values the opinion of Sidna Musa and how much the experience of Sidna Musa as a Prophet to Banu Israel was relevant. So, so that's one reason. The second reason is all the stories about Sidna Musa and Banu Israel, they're not about, indeed, if you look deep, they're not about Banu Israel, they're not about Sidna Musa. All of that is gone. They're about us. So anytime you read about Sidna Musa and, and Banu Israel, his struggles with them and how he conveyed to them and his personal traits and his psychological traits and his in, 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 you ought to ask yourself, what is this telling me about me? What does that tell us about us here? A lot of people take this verse in the Quran and they become hard. They look at what Jewish people and they're bad and they're this and they're that and so on. And so if look at what they've done to Sidna Musa. Well, they've done all of that. Excuse me. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Apologies. They have done, Alhamdulillah. All of that has been done to the Prophet to Sidna Musa, so we don't fall into it. And indeed, we fell into so much of, Alhamdulillah, we fell into so much of what Banu Israel had done. And all that which Sidna Musa warned against, we find it ahead of us again and again. So this story of Sidna Musa in 
Surah Al-Kahf is very unique. It was not repeated anywhere. Part of Sidna Musa's stories have been repeated in Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah and so on and so forth. Um, the, his beginnings and so on and so forth have been repeated in Surah Taha, have been repeated in Surah Al-Qasas, have been repeated in Surah Saad, have been and so on. Anbiya, many other surahs, many other surahs, right? But this section about Sidna Musa, this, this story of Sidna Musa is unique to Surah Al-Kahf. It hasn't been repeated anywhere. Just, just in Surah Al-Kahf and it never mentioned anywhere. So what's the core of the story? The core of the story is that Sidna Musa one day was standing up in the pulpit giving his sermon. As the Prophet ﷺ tells us in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet, was, the Prophet is telling the Sahaba the, the, the root of the story of Sidna Musa in Surah Al-Kahf with Sidna Al-Khadr. Standing up on a pulpit, all of a sudden, one of the people asked him, he was so eloquent, he was good, he was giving them information and so on and so forth. And one of the people asked from the audience, is there anybody more knowledgeable than you, O Moses, on earth? And he said, no, I'm the most knowledgeable on earth. And that was, that was something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reproached on Sidna Musa. Since he did not say, Allah alam, Allah knows best. Allah knows best, there might be, Allah knows best. And he did not put the knowledge to all of that to Allah Ta'ala. He ascribed it to himself. He did not ascribe it to Allah Ta'ala. So Allah wants to teach him a very deep lesson. A very deep lesson. And teach him and teach all of us through him in this journey. And the journey was not about teaching Sidna Musa a lesson. It's about teaching, about teaching all of us and all who are audiences about, about, about a very important fact of life. Not just religious life. Of life in general, right? So, see, Allah Taala told Sidna Musa to, to, to that, you know, uh, why didn't you ascribe knowledge to me? And say, Allah Alam, you ascribe it to yourself. You know what? There is somebody who is more knowledgeable to, than you. The moment Sidna Musa knew that there is somebody who is more knowledgeable than him, Sidna Musa, Sidna Musa asked Allah Taala, "Who is this person? I want to go learn from him." Now, how many times we get the opportunity to, to see people who are more knowledgeable for, from us and we, we accept the fact that they're more knowledgeable for us and it doesn't mean much to us. Somebody more knowledgeable than me is an opportunity to get closer to Allah Ta'ala. It's an opportunity that is the greatest opportunity. How much do we spend looking for those people? And when we find those people, we treat them like relics. MashaAllah, Shaykh that and that, and he knows a lot. And so again, knowing a lot is not a knowing a lot by itself is not a is not a uh, is not a is not a meritorious thing. <laughs> I mean, it may not be a meritorious thing. It's doing a lot, but embodying all of that, embodying it, living it, living it. That's the most important thing. So the Prophet Sallallahu Musa told us that told Allah Taala, where is he? I want to meet with this person. I want to learn from him. The fact that he knew that there is somebody more knowledgeable for him instigated and, and, and lit that fire of knowledge, of knowing, or being like, of knowing in his heart. And he's not going to stop. He's going to leave his people. He's going to look. He receives the wahi. He talks to Allah Ta'ala. He has all of that. And he knows that somebody is knowledgeable than him, more knowledgeable. He's going to go seek that person. He didn't say, I am the one who speaks to Allah Ta'ala indirectly. I'm the one who receives the wahi. If anybody would say, I have enough, it would be Sidna Musa. But he didn't. He did not. He knew that uh, the moment he knows that I am not, I need to know. I need to know. Then he went. There is somebody more knowledgeable for me. I'm going to go. And he picked up himself. And Allah Ta'ala gave him the signs. Whenever you lose the, the fish, you're going, to, you're going to find that. So we went to this whole story. Uh, found a man who is really does not have any signs of knowledge. Has no signs that he's knowledgeable. Knowledge, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, does not always wear this. Closeness to Allah Ta'ala does, does not always you know, ha have appearances. And this is where we get it all wrong a lot of times. A lot of times for us, we, 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 we ascribe a lot, of a lot of weight to the, to the appearance of people, right? And got ijazah from this, and got ijazah from this, and got ijazah from this, and got a PhD from this, and got a PhD. And all of that is good and beautiful, right? But being prophetic is something, can be some, a lot of times something that is deeper than that. Deeper than the appearances. Deep, deeper than the accolades. The accolades don't make you a servant of Allah Ta'ala. Your behavior does. 
your commitment does. Your love, your heart, your your that's what it does. So he wants somebody who doesn't who doesn't look like much, sleeping, hiding himself, as was mentioned in the hadith, in a very right. Now, mind you, that the whole story is there is there is a backdrop in the seer of the Prophet. They came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Oh Muhammad, who are the people of the who are they, we're asking about three things. The Jewish people came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahih Bukhari. We have three things I want to ask you about. One of them, or tell us about the people of the Kaf. And that's how we end, that's how we end up. So, and tell us about the soul. And tell us about this and tell us about that. And the Prophet Sallallahu was taught in the Quran in Surah Al-Kaf, not, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلُ ذَلِكِ غَدًا إِلَّا أَيَّ شَاءَ اللَّهِ Don't say in Surah Al-Kaf, Allah Ta'ala said, and don't say to something that, that, uh, uh, that I'm going to be some doing to be doing something until Allah wills. Because he said, come to me tomorrow and I'll give you the answer of these things. So, well, if Allah Ta'ala doesn't reveal to you tomorrow, then what? And indeed, Allah did not reveal to him the second day. And then they come to him and he say, when? It's like, well, next next day. And he said, and Allah is telling him, look, you say whenever Allah reveals to me, I'll tell you. But don't dictate to Allah. Don't, don't think that you have control. You don't have control. You don't have control. And that was a very big lesson to the Prophet, our Prophet Wasallam. So the Surah Sidna Musa came in this context to, to emphasize that Allah Ta'ala knows. To trust the knowledge of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala more than we trust our knowledge. The all in all, you know the story. Sidna Musa, Sidna Musa, uh, Sidna Musa, and Sidna Al Khadr, you know, rode this uh, this 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 ship, uh, the small the small ship, and then they and then afterwards didn't have money, and then he and then he put a hole in it, and then he or destroyed part of it that it become un, uh, uh, unfunctional for a couple of days, and he did kill the boy, and he built the the, the wall, and you know the story. It's all clear in Surah Kaf. There's no reason to repeat the, the events. But if you think about, you step back and you look at your life and how many things went wrong in your life, the answer is in this surah, in this part, in this section in here. How many things went wrong? How many things you did not like the outcome? How many things the appearance of looked so good and it turned out so bad? Or looked so bad and it turned out so good? How many times? How many times? We cannot count. How many times this happened? How many times this happened to me? I was so upset that I ended up in PhD program in Indiana University. Like what, what, I'm like at the middle of nowhere in Indiana University, what am I doing in Indiana University? I applied to 10 Ivy Leagues and I thought highly of themselves coming from Dar Hadith and so on and so forth. And I'm gonna be doing this and I'm gonna be doing that. And Allah said, you know, go to Indiana University. And I went to Indiana University and they were the best years of my life in America. The best years, hands down, the best years in my life in America was in Indiana University. I was beautiful in every way. The people that I met, the encounters that I had, the experience that I, and so on and so forth. The growth that I had intellectually and so on and so forth. It was, it was beautiful years, beautiful years. I had no idea and I did not like it and I didn't vouch for it. When I was accepting the Indiana University, I was just like, whatever. You know, probably I'll, prob probably I'll change next year. But, and if you look in your life, there are multiple instances like that. Trust in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't just look in the world from a very empirical way. There isn't just what you see that is out there. This is what life, this is what the empiricists and, and scientists want us to believe. This is what materialism want us to believe. This is what, this is what a lot of, a lot of views of liberalism, a lot of views of the world want us to believe right now. That the, all, all what you see is what you got. All what you see is what you got. So we, we predicate our relationships and our lives and our choices because of that. We take away the concept of faith and the concept that Allah controls every single thing, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who manages every single thing. And now Sidna Musa, Sidna al Khadr is revealing to Sidna Musa the truth behind things. This is what the truth behind things. You look from outward and you only see the boat being broken and gratefulness. And so on and so forth. They give him a ride and then they did all of that and he broke and gratefulness. That's the outset. That's the outward. But then Allah Ta'ala revealed the truth to Sidna Musa that he didn't see, that there is something behind that. There is a qadr behind what you see. So much of what you see around, there is so much behind it that we don't know. That is governed by the hikmah of Allah, by the wisdom of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala and governed by His mercy and governed by His qayyumiyah. Without, without His qayyumiyah, nothing of the world will, will, will remain. 
the way it is, will vanish and, and, and will not stand. And the, the, every single thing in our, in our modern world teach us the opposite, that all you see is what you got. Whether in relationships, whether in, uh, in, uh, in, in dealing with rizq, in dealing with our sustenance, and dealing with so on. And we forget that Allah is the one who is Razak. We forget that there is truth behind our truth. Our truth that is physical is very minimal compared to the real truth. And indeed, it takes tremendous amount of a tremendous amount of tawakkul, tremendous amount of faith and iman that we have to develop through our qiyam, through our dhikr, through our salat, through our companionship with the righteous people. And now the, the, and now the window of the ghaib and the thickness of the veil between us and those realities start becoming transparent and we can see the hand of Allah working in the world, working in us, the choices we make, and so on, guiding us and, and leading us to the, to the shores of safety and salvation and transformation. Every single thing, even our, even our religious discourse became extremely materialistic that every moment we have to fundraise everything we we try uh, uh, every moment becomes a moment of 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 echoing the jahili ways and echoing the materialistic world now every institution now be, wants to become echoing what what the what the greatest institutions of materialism do and they are successful in our minds only when they start echoing those things when they start mirroring what the institutions of Jahiliya are producing. And we forget. I, I talk to people in, in boards and they say, all we want to do is we want to balance in board of the masjids and board of, uh, we want to balance the, the, we want to balance the, uh, the, the budget of the, of the masjid. And now they become businessmen. All they want to do is having a rainy day account of 500,000 and $700,000 to, to, to really have a rainy day. Look, look, what is the razak? What is the event? What is the faith? While people are poor, while people are destitute, well, that money could help so many people change their life and transform it. And they want to have a rainy day account. Faith does not counter. Materialism counts. This is, what's, this is what the story is about. The parents of the child will die, will cry for two days or three days or a month or two or, or, or a year. But Allah will give them something better. But they will not cry for the eternity when they see their child going to hellfire. And so much of our interest, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, to feed our children, to make them better, get them to great schools and this and this and that. And little is given to making them better human beings who are worthy on being denizens of paradise. We care so much about what they wear and we work hard and hard to make them. But how much are we devoted for the akhirah? And even if they, they don't make life, they don't become engineers or doctors, it's okay. It's not a big deal, as long as they are good people, believers first, and then whatever it else comes afterwards is great. And righteousness has a price, had a price and has a reward. And I'll wrap up with this, inshallah. Righteousness has a price. And the price of righteousness is that committing to Allah Ta'ala, committing to the Prophet Sallallahu following the right path, being with the righteous people, and so on and so forth. And it has a reward. Even after you pass away, Allah takes care of your business. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا And the father of two boys that's in al Khadr builds the wall for, so the wall can be like a monument that, that preserves the place of their treasure. What was the reasoning? Why did he do that? Their father was a... They say he was not their father in the books of Tafsir. It was like their, their fifth or sixth grandfather. Look at how much righteousness matters. Righteousness, my righteousness and your righteousness matters in preserving our progeny and taking care of them and so on and so forth. And I've seen that in my life. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people came back to Allah Ta'ala because their great, great grandfather was a great man. And Allah Ta'ala preserved his progeny or her progeny because they were righteous people. So it's not always what you see. There is the faith truth. And that faith truth is something that we all can perceive if we take away the veils of, the thick veils of materialism, the thick veils of forgetfulness and heedlessness, and we can start seeing things as they are. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu used to say a beautiful dua, and I end up with this. He would say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma inni as'aluka, Allahumma arini al-haqqa haqqan, warzuqni tiba. Allah, make me see the truth as truth, and cause me to follow it, and make me see falsehood as falsehood, 
and cause me to stay away from it. Because, because materialism and individualism create a veil for us from seeing things as they are. They might be poisonous for us, but we still eat them. I'm talking about ideas. I'm talking about sentiments. I'm talking about likes and dislikes. I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about all of that that we've been fed on a daily basis while our palate is completely ruined when we cannot taste faith. And we cannot, our palate is not, a, is not, is not uh, uh, informed by faith so we can see good and bad and taste the rotten from the fresh. We gobble every single thing. Why? Because our palate is, is, is done. So we, 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 what the surah, what the section is telling us is to be aware not to fall into the materialistic world and to just think, have just appearances as we see and as we, and that's it. There is always, there is always truth to the things. How do we get to the truth of things? That's where faith comes in. That's where building faith comes in. That's what companionship of the righteous comes in. And the whole thing is, all of that would not have happened to Sidna Musa unless he had a great companionship of a man who knows better than him. Now, who is better? Sidna Musa or Sidna Khadr? Sidna Musa was better in the sight of Allah, for sure. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that Sidna Khadr was given something that Sidna Musa didn't have. That doesn't make him better than him. Sidna Musa is better. But Sidna Khadr came to teach him a lesson. And through him, we all taught that lesson. The Prophet ﷺ, after he recited, after he told the story of Sidna Khadr to the Sahaba and Sidna Musa, he said to them in Sahih Muslim, I wish, I wish that Sidna Musa was patient enough. So Allah Ta'ala will tell us more about the story of Al Khadr. Are we patient enough? Are we patient enough in, in deciphering the signs of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala so we can read our realities better? Are we patient enough? in following the path of faith and iman and dhikr and qiyam and salat upon the Prophet and companionship of the righteous. Are we patient enough? I pray we are. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.